Hi guys, Firefighter Raven just created his own Patreon. If you would like to donate to the original author, the link will be in the comments. Let's start the story now. Humans are a Myth Part 3.1 This story is set in the final battle for the Wraith home world. Riding Trails of Fire Lieutenant Yaram Tazi walked around her Black Widow starfighter, waiting for the balloon to go up. She ran a hand over its smooth surface. She looked for any flaws that might be fatal in space combat. On the other side, her crew chief did the same, and then they'd switch to double-check. She admired the sleek deadliness of the design. Just over 18 meters long and 5 meters tall, armed with four autocannons firing armor-piercing rounds and two missile launchers along the underside of the spacecraft. She's powered by two engines mounted in the rear and multiple navigational thrusters all over the craft to allow supreme mobility in space and 360-degree spin without losing speed or direction. After the checks were done and her crew chief agreed with her assessment, it was ready for combat. After settling into the cockpit, she began the check of the instruments, sensors, AUD, oxygen hookups to her flight suit, and alignment of the sensors in her helmet. She signaled her readiness, and the ground crew loaded her bird into one of Revenge's 120 launch tubes. She was a little nervous. This wasn't her first taste of space combat, but none of the other fights were this big. As her flight's youngest pilot, she was in the last launch tube to the right of her flight's element leader. She jumped slightly when the command came over her headset. Eco Squadron launch. The acceleration pushed her against the seat back as she rocketed down the tube. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw the bright flare from hundreds of other fighters exiting the ship. The voice of her flight leader came over their flight's tack channel. Form up on me and let's get this party started. Lieutenant Tazi took her position to the right and slightly behind her element leader, who was in a similar position to the flight leader. She didn't recognize the voice that came over the squadron tack net. Mother of God! But she agreed with it. The space before her was filled with thousands of rocket flares of missiles and torpedoes. Railgun rounds, only visible because of a special coating that acted like the tracers of old, were so thick it looked like you could walk on them. Pulses of plasma and laser fire crisscrossed the region between the two fleets. Enemy fighters rose from the ranks of Wraith warships, and coalition fighters and bombers rushed to greet them. A vast dance of death began as the Wraith fighters met the coalition fighters in the spaces between, and the waves of destruction the larger ships threw at each other. Here and there, an unlucky fighter or bomber ended up in the line of fire from the behemoths and briefly lit up a small piece of space as it exploded. She tried her best to stay with her element leader as he got on the tail of a wraith fighter. His autocannon slugs took huge chunks from the enemy fighter before it exploded in a brilliant flash. And off they went, looking for another target in the massive sphere of dogfighting ships. Coalition fighters were better built and had better tech, but the wraith fighters were damn fast, maneuverable, and so damn many of them. For everyone the killed... Three more seemed to take its place. Yaram felt a shudder in her ship and automatically scanned her screens. Her armor had held with no significant damage. She had a wraith fighter on her tail doing its best to kill her. She fired her port thrusters, and her ship flipped 180 degrees. She squeezed the trigger and watched the slugs punch holes through the enemy cockpit, the enemy fighter losing control and zipping by her. She flipped again and went looking for her wingman. She spotted him just in time to see his ship disintegrate after being unlucky enough to be in the path of a plasma bolt, meant for an opposing capital ship. She started to look for her flight leader when the group leader's voice came over the tack net. Echo Squadron, support bomber squadrons, three and six. Attack runs on enemy capital ships at grid X-ray 25. I repeat, X-ray 25. Suppress all enemy point defense weapons while the bombers make their runs. She located the correct grid and headed that way. She passed the bombers on her way to attack the nearest cruiser, putting out AA fire. 
She skimmed only a few meters above the cruiser's hull, pouring fire into any weapon systems in her way, and then turned around to do it along the other side of the cruiser. One down, but so many more to go. Her squadron swarmed over the closest cruisers and capital ships, reducing the volume of fire, but not ending it completely. They did their best, but several bombers were hit while doing their run. The others bored in on their targets, released their bombs, and quickly high-tailed back to their carriers for rearmament. Yaram watched as the bombs hit their targets, but instead of exploding, they released a sticky molecular acid to eat through the hull. Yaram returned to the Revenge after seeing how low her fuel and ammunition were. There was wreckage everywhere, chunks of metal and bodies hanging in space. She landed in the assigned hangar and waited for the ground crew to get her out of the cockpit. She ordered more fuel and ammo restocked before taking care of personal business and then reporting to the CAG. She made her report and was given her new orders. While not as massive as the human motherships, the enemy flagship was still twice the size of Wraith capital ships. Despite heavy damage, it was still operational and extremely dangerous. Its main batteries were devastating coalition capital ships and damaging the mothership. So the Admiral elected to send 100 heavily armed Marines to board it and destroy it from the inside. She was to join a dozen other fighters and escort the breaching pods against the Wraith flagship. After launching, Yaram linked up with the four breaching pods and their escorts. Navigating the gap between the forces had become more complicated with all the wreckage from Wraith and Coalition ships floating around. But it also gave the little convoy some cover until they were almost to the flagship. As soon as they left the debris field, the fighters accelerated and began suppressing enemy defense batteries in the breaching pod's path. Yaram was so intent on watching the pod attached to the flagship's hull and begin boarding procedures that she never knew the Wraith fighter was there. A half dozen shots blew holes in her ship. She had just a moment to berate herself and then felt a moment of pain before her fighter exploded and became another piece of flotsam on the battlefield. Humans are a Myth, Part 3.2 Planetside events during the final battle in Part 3 Poor, Bloody Infantry Lance Corporal Harker looked at his watch again only one minute after the last time he checked. He always did this before combat. Check the watch, the rifle, the watch, and the rifle. He looked up and saw Caglo laughing at his pre-combat routine. Caglo was his Dolvod battle buddy. They'd been fighting together for months and were the only ones left of their original platoon. They'd been through a lot of shit together these last nine months. Bexar 12. Regula 2. Drexia Prime, and that absolute nightmare battle for the Jexian colony on the third moon of Lorena II. Coalition forces suffered 95% casualties by the time the last of those damn wraiths were down. The ground pounders took 85% of those casualties from the ground combat, which made Harker wake up in a cold sweat on the bad nights. The Jexian factories let the wraith pump out weapons by the thousands. And even worse, Half of those damn factories were underground. They couldn't be wrecked from space or by air support. So it was up to the infantry to root them out with rifles, grenades, swords, and bayonets. The poor, bloody infantry, PBIs, as they referred to themselves, carried the day, but the cost was high. Entire companies were wiped out. The 4324th was massacred when they assaulted a factory complex under the capital city. 12,000 troopers went in and none came out. Alive anyways. It took the ghouls, grave registration, two weeks to connect all the remains from the tunnels and buildings, and another six months to collect and identify everything they had. The wraith tore them apart, literally. The close quarters meant they were practically on top of you before you even realized that. The 43 on 25th gave as good as they got, though. They only left a couple thousand of the estimated 25k wraith they engaged. That was the battle that wiped out their platoon and left just Caglo and himself as uninjured survivors. Harker rechecked his watch, looked at the Dulvad, and signaled five minutes to go. 
They double-checked each other's gear, especially the jump packs. It was a long way down if it failed. It was time. Harker gave Caglo a fist bump and then checked to ensure the rest of his fire team was ready. The back of the dropship opened and Harker and Caglo stepped to the edge. The light turned green and they leapt into the air. The rest of his squad followed them. Two more sticks came after. Harker enjoyed the sensation of free fall that came before activating the jump pack. Go too early and you are an easy target for the wraiths. Wait too long and you can mess yourself up from the sudden change in direction. Harker fired the jets and landed safely. The rest of his men did as well, but someone from the other sticks messed up and came down like a stone. He landed with a scream and a thud. Harker ran over to check, even if he knew the trooper didn't survive. They'd landed on their heads, so at least it was quick. He jogged over to join his sergeant and lieutenant to get his orders. SOP was for the first units to secure the landing zone. His squad was ordered to sweep and clear the closest buildings and then set up an OP. He'd get a pair of heavy weapon teams once the objective was secured. They used the tried-and-true infantry tactic as they approached the three-story buildings. Caglo rushed his fire team forward ten meters while Harker's team covered them. And then Caglo's went to ground to provide cover as Harker's group rushed past them and dropped at ten meters. They did this to the buildings. One team moved while the other covered them. It was slow progress, but safer with a possible strong point ahead. Upon reaching the buildings, they began to sweep them, but found nothing. Even the thermals showed it was clear. Harker had his team take up defensive positions while he sent a runner to notify command the building was secure. While they waited, they began to improve the fortifications with materials taken from another nearby building. Squad-level rail guns covered the front with interlocking fields of fire, mortar pits were dug behind the buildings, and walls around windows were strengthened with sandbags and extra layers of material. Forty-five minutes later, other units had moved up and secured a perimeter around what was now the command post, and Cole Flagg gave a briefing on the next stage of the operation. Beside her was a Rossi, dressed in rags and covered in bruises and scars. Cole Flagg began. Words come down that all drop troops made their LZs and were good to go with the next stage. She moved aside to show a map of the city on the wall. Objectives were marked on it as known locations of enemy troops. The colonel gestured to the Rossi. This is Jalaka, and he's been here for seven years now. According to him, there are many other slaves that live inside the cities. He's also told us the wraiths are there in force and have been preparing for the invasion for weeks now. Colflag continued. Our orders are to drive the wraith out of the city, minimize civilian casualties, and secure it. This won't be easy. Mechs, artillery, TATs, and even air support are of extremely limited use in this environment. It's a ship job, but the Admiral knows who to call for that. The poor, bloody infantry, shouted the troopers, taking a sort of pride in getting the dirtiest and nastiest jobs to do, and doing it or die trying. Dismissed, she said, returning the soldier's salute. It had been three hours since they began the assault, and they were barely a block in. All hell had broken loose when coalition troopers entered the city. LCPL Harker and his squad were engaged in a firefight with a group of wraith in a four-story building ahead of them. Harker was trying to make himself as small a target as possible while trying to pinpoint that damn pulse laser emplacement. Miller's squad had been caught in the open when it fired on them. He had to leave seven dead when he pulled out, so now it was Harker's job to take it out. He'd sent Caglo and his fire team into a nearby building to clear it and then distract the gunners until Harker's team could cross the open ground and assault the building. But he still wasn't sure which floor the damn thing was on. A fusillade of coalition projectiles struck several possible locations for the gun. Fuck it. Harker thought before he ran across the street, stooped as low as he could and still run in his armor. He took cover in the doorway while waiting for his team to cross. So far, so good, he said to himself. 
The last of his troopers went down as the pulse laser finally announced itself. Shit, he thought, and then gave orders to his team. They split into pairs and slowly advanced down the hallway, checking each room before moving on. They did this room by room, floor by floor, before finally locating the gun. He listened but couldn't tell how many wraith were in there. Harker sent two troopers to the room directly below them. Once they were in place, Harker's team kicked in the door and fired into the room. The wraith gunners were caught by surprise but reacted quickly and dove to the floor. The second they hit the floor, a volley of shots pierced the floor from below, shredding the prone wraith. After determining they were the only ones in the room, he crossed to the window and gave the signal that it was done. He tossed the pulse laser out of the window and had the satisfaction of seeing it break into pieces. The wraith wouldn't recover that weapon. They finished clearing the building, met up with Caglo's team, and went stalking the next strong point. As they crept along the wall of the next building, Harker reminded himself it could be worse. The geists were fighting below ground in the tunnels and sewers. A sound from behind a door almost earned a grenade through the window before realizing they were civilians. But before they went, one of them pointed out another wraith strong point. For three long days, the Coalition forces fought a vicious close-quarters battle with the wraith defenders. This allowed the Wraith to use their natural abilities to their fullest, and casualty lists showed that. The Coalition took more casualties from the puncture wounds of claws, talons, and fangs than weapons fire. Wraith claws, talons, and teeth met Coalition bayonets, swords, and other melee weapons. Coalition rifles became secondary to human shotguns and various pistols in the tight confines of urban combat. Block by block, street by street, building by building, floor by floor, and room by room, they battled the stubborn enemy. The Wraith used the lessons learned during years of combat with coalition forces, and they learned them well. Companies went in and came back as a platoon. Dead and wounded were brought out by the suicidally brave medics. Numerous lives were saved because they were willing to go right to the front line and retrieve the wounded. For three days the fighting raged until the Wraith finally had nowhere to fall back to. They took over a large factory located near the city center and wanted to make the coalition pay the butcher's bill to drive them out. But that wasn't needed. Thermals and other devices determined there were only Wraith inside, so command called in a bombardment from orbit. Once that was done, the infantry rushed the ruins and finished off any survivors before they could recover. One city down, dozens to go. LCPL Harker sat with his helmet off and his back to a wall. His helmet, armor, and weapons were covered in the gore from several species. He looked towards Caglo, but he wasn't there anymore. He got jumped by three wraiths and managed to kill two before the third brought him down. Harker killed the third and then wept as his friend died in his arms. Only five members of his squad were still hale. The rest were dead, wounded, or missing. He tried to take solace in the low number of civilian casualties, but it was hard to remember that after his closest friend, his battle buddy, and his brother had joined thousands of others in death. Right now he just wanted out of this armor, some hot food, a shower, and some sleep. Not necessarily in that order. He knew this wasn't done. There were more cities and camps to liberate before it was done. But humanity's final revenge was almost here. Humans are a Myth, Part 4 Admiral Tanaka surveyed the wreckage of thousands of ships from both sides of the battle. As he watched, rescue ships were scouring the wreckage for survivors. Thousands of capital ships floated dead in space, their hulls cracked open or holed from the barrages thrown at both sides. Many smaller craft were hardly more than a cloud of debris, the frozen bodies of their pilots nearby. The fighting in space was over. The destruction of the enemy flagship threw the wraith into complete disarray. Any form of organized resistance fell apart and left the wraith ships easy pickings for the coalition fleet. 
The battle on the surface still raged, but coalition ground forces, assisted by hundreds of thousands of slaves rising against their oppressors, had wraith ground forces reeling. Coalition warships assisted with the orbital bombing of marked targets. The death throes of the wraith's once vast empire consumed the lives of millions on both sides, but the campaign was finally over. Admiral Tanaka thought to himself, the long campaign of revenge was over. It was time to rebuild the human race. Kelvac was sound asleep when the chirp of the communicator woke him. This better be good. He muttered to himself and was surprised to see the Kexian ambassador to the Great Council. I'm sorry to disturb your rest, Elder Kolvak, but a matter has come up, and your assistance would be greatly appreciated. Kolvak listened in stunned silence as the ambassador explained the situation to him. When he had finished, Kolvak finally spoke. Of course I will dress and meet you in the capital chambers. All across the territory that made up the Grand Council, a single phrase was broadcast on every channel and every screen. It appeared in both Galactic Common and the native languages. It simply said, We are coming. This is repeated every day in the Grand Council's chambers just after the session was opened. The Council members became more agitated by the day. Was a new enemy announcing their arrival? What did it mean? On the ninth day, another message went out on every channel. We are here. The Grand Council received another message. Tomorrow is Judgment Day. This phrase sent the Council into an uproar. Calls of distress, fear, and fury rang out in the halls in hundreds of voices. Everyone was so agitated that none noticed the handful of delegations that simply sat and watched with their equivalent of little smiles on their faces. Even the normally Dor Barrett scenes seemed highly amused at the chaos. It had been many cycles since Kovac had been in the Grand Council chambers, but he wouldn't miss this for anything. He never thought he'd set foot in these chambers again. He took his seat in the Kexian delegation's designated area and looked around at the various delegations, seeing the look of fear and worry on their faces. He nodded to the few beings that weren't acting in the same way. Garnick, the long-serving council speaker, brought the noise to a hush with a single tap of the bell-like device on the podium. He spoke the ritual opening. This convocation has now begun. Let all speak as equals and maintain the bonds of peace while inside these hallowed halls. Before Garnick could say another word, Korkon spoke up. Council Speaker, if I may? Garnick seemed annoyed by the breach of protocol but saw no reason to object. The Speaker recognizes the Kexian Ambassador. Korkon walked to the center of the chamber. I ask permission for a guest to address this august body. The last said with a subtle mockery most of the ambassadors missed. A voice shouted from the upper rows, Why should we waste our time with this when there is an important matter to discuss? Korkan faced the direction the question came from. Tut tut, Ambassador Zanara, you know the rules. Until my request is approved or denied, no other comments may be made. Garnick rumbled his agreement and then followed up with, Does any ambassador second this motion? Seconded, came the reply from a half-dozen ambassadors. Korkan looked at the speaker, his eyes asking the question. Garnick simply said, Proceed. Korkan once again addressed the assembly. Honored ambassadors, dignitaries, and guests, for the last several days we've received a series of cryptic messages and we've worried and wondered about them. With a dramatic pause before continuing, the last one indicated today to be Judgment Day. My guest will enlighten us today about the meanings of those messages. With that, he stepped back and indicated the center of the floor with a wave of his arm. There was a slight shimmering and a being in armor seemed to appear from nowhere. The helmet's faceplate was opaque and gave no hint of the occupant. All they could tell was that they had one head and two arms and were bipedal. The being reached a hand over to press something on the wrist of the other arm. The armor retracted into several parts of the uniform worn by the strange being. 
A few astonished gasps erupted from the oldest members of the assembly. Even Garnick was shocked. It can't be, he exclaimed. The being stepped forward. I am President Matilda Becker of the New Terran Republic and head of the Andromedan Coalition. She looked at the various members of the assembly. The humans have returned to the galaxy of our birth. She paused at the uproar her words elicited and waited until it died down. Fifty human years ago, the Wraith, as we call them, attacked members of this Grand Council. Scorn filled her voice as she used the title. We called for war against them to support the weaker races they attacked. This council talked and did nothing. Only seven governments stood at our side and drove the wraith from this galaxy. She began to pace as she talked. And what was our reward? She was angry as she answered her question. We were betrayed by a member of this council, and our worlds were destroyed. Our home, our cradle world, and the rest of the soul system were obliterated. She reached under her uniform and pulled out some sort of tag on a chain around her neck. This, this is what we still have of our worlds. Each human ID tag carries a piece of our destroyed worlds as a reminder of what we lost. She stopped and faced a section of the chamber. Her voice turned menacing. And a promise to deal with the ones who almost extinguished the spark of the human race. Five human years ago, we repaid the race for their destruction of our worlds and the genocide against our race. We made friends and allies in the Andromeda Galaxy, who had also suffered at their hands. We formed the Coalition and fought the Wraith across hundreds of worlds and vast expanses of space, until we stood on the doorstep of their home world. Millions of lives were lost in that final campaign before it was done. The Wraith's empire was liberated and the few surviving Wraith were exiled to a small moon. They will never be allowed to leave it. She looked up as she spoke. We learned many new things and found new technology to improve the lives of all the members of the Coalition. My armor is just a small part of those improvements. She then looked directly at one delegation as she said, and we learned who betrayed us. The chamber once again broke out in a cacophony of noises from hundreds of sources. President Becker called out. Ambassador Sin Amana of the Brath. Looking directly at the Brath delegation. Will you join me on the chamber's floor? Every eye turned to look at the Brath ambassador. They all saw the same shimmer as before, and four humans were revealed to be standing behind them. The wild-eyed Brath looked for a way to escape, but the four humans prevented that. They picked him up and marched him to the floor. They weren't particularly cruel in their handling of the ambassador, but neither were they respectful of his position. Once the ambassador was brought before her, the Terran president nodded to her troopers, and they released the ambassador, who immediately slumped to the floor. President Becker towered over the Brath ambassador. Sinamana of the Broth, your people stand accused of providing information to the Wraith that led to the destruction of hundreds of human colonies and billions of human lives. Shinamana looked up and pleaded. I wasn't even born when this happened. I'm innocent. True, but it was the Brath government that did, and you are a member of that government. She said, her voice thick with anger. She took a round device from a pouch on her belt and tossed it on the floor. It projected a huge 3D image of a planet. Do you recognize this world, Ambassador? She asked. It's Prath. He replied. The image changed to a security feed from one of the Prath warships in orbit. Do you recognize the Brathy at the bridge of this cruiser? It's my son. Please don't hurt him. He begged. She pushed another button. Speak to him. The ambassador looked confused. How? She indicated the image. It was obvious something was happening on the ship as Tex furiously worked on their consoles, and his son was visibly confused. Bardra, it is your father. He tentatively spoke, not believing it would work. The image of his son started looking around for the source before replying. Father? Where are you? 
I am in the Grand Council Chambers. The President cut the ambassador off. Tell him something is going to happen and to not do anything stupid. Chinamana spoke to his son and relayed the message. She nodded at one of the guards, and from behind the helmet, a voice simply said, Now! The image split to show the planet and the cruiser's bridge at the same time. Hundreds and then thousands of specks of lights appeared above the globe, and some were seen through the cruiser's viewscreen. Each speck grew until it flashed, and in its place was a ship. Thousands of ships were suddenly there. You could see the startled look on Sinamana's son as this happened. He was just starting to give some orders when the president opened the link again. Tell him to stop what he is doing and radio their fleet to stand down. Despite his misgivings, the ambassador passed the message on and convinced his son to give the orders. Excellent, ambassador. You are doing great. President Becker said, with a hint of condescension in her voice, she turned to address the assembly. Esteemed ambassadors, I wish to introduce you to a small portion of the coalition's war fleet. She paused for dramatic effect before continuing. They just jumped in directly from Andromeda. At this pronouncement, the chambers erupted into shouts and insults, calling her a liar, and worse. She held up her hand for quiet, but it took Speaker Garnick practically smashing the bell-like device to quiet them down. I say this not to brag, but as a warning. Calling in reinforcements would be a very bad idea. She began to walk around the floor again, focusing their attention on her movements. As for those that called me a liar, I would ask some friends to verify the claim. She dramatically swept her arm towards the delegations of her longtime friends and allies. Before revealing ourselves for this session, we made contact with our old allies from the fight against the Wraith. She smiled warmly at the Kexian delegation, whose ties with humanity ran very deep. And representatives of their governments were invited to visit our new home world and also testify to our ability to travel with such speed. She looked around the chambers before saying, My friends, if you would be so kind as to verify my claims. With that, the delegations from the Kexian, Kithranka, Berethians, Zathrex, Galians, Malakitsin, and Xrexians stood up and confirmed the human's claim. While some might have been willing to call out the smaller races as being puppets of the humans, no one would ever call out the Kithranka as liars. They'd been known to rip off the offender's appendages and beat them to death with it. Part of joining the Grand Council, as a new ambassador, was being specifically warned about it and watching the footage of a massive Shulkor learning that lesson the hard way. Despite being twice his size, the Kithrankan ambassador ripped off the Shulkor ambassador's tail and nearly killed him with it. Only its vast size and pleading from the speaker kept it from dying. Now where were we? She said, tapping her finger against her chin as if she was thinking. It was obvious to Kovvak that she was enjoying herself immensely. Our betrayal at the hands of the breath. Staring directly at the ambassador, she looked at one of her guards, an unspoken question passing between them. At his nod, she turned to the globe and changed the image. It showed a large room, decorated with priceless gems and medals. Ambassador Keen Amana, do you recognize this room? She asked. He tore his eyes away from her predatory gaze with a distinct effort. It's the Brophy throne room. He replied, confusion and fear showing on his face. President Becker nodded to her aide again, who gave a barely audible command over his comms. Now. The view changed as the camera turned to show dozens of brothy on their knees, human soldiers standing behind them. The camera then panned to the left and showed a brothy male, gowned in bejeweled robes, kneeling before a pair of humans. Ambassador Sinamana was shocked, but numbly answered when the president ordered him to confirm his identity. That is Emperor Cartharax IV of the brothy Empire. He turned to look at the human president again. But how the throne room is the most secure place in the Empire? President Becker merely winked and replied, Trade secret. 
She looked around the chamber and raised her voice. Does anyone dispute that our actions are permitted under Grand Council law? No one objected, she continued. In light of their actions assisting the Wraith in their genocidal actions against my people, does anyone contest our right to deal out justice in any manner we chose aside from total annihilation of the Brock? Once again, the chamber remained silent. The president glanced at her aide and nodded. He gave another barely audible command, and one of the humans guarded the emperor prodded him with his boot. Can you hear me, your majesty? She asked. The kneeling figure just nodded. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, she said. Yes, I can hear you, the emperor replied, his voice and demeanor submissive. Good. I want you to hear my proclamation of our actions in obtaining justice for you for enabling such a horrible crime against humanity at the same time as this assembly. She took another dramatic pause before continuing. The order to relay the location of our worlds came directly from Emperor Catharax III. His death put him beyond our reach, but we do have you, Emperor. She looked out at the assembly before continuing. You will abdicate your throne immediately. The monarchy is dissolved, and you will be our guest on New Terra. She turned to the brothy ambassador. Kinamana, you will help organize a new government for your people. I don't care which form it takes, but choose one to benefit your people. Chinamana nodded before speaking. What are the other terms? Your empire took several colonies by aggressive actions against weaker races. You will give them back. How you do it to be decided by negotiations with the respective races? Chinamana looked crestfallen. I understand. His reply was barely audible. And what happens to my people? The president smiled and simply said, Nothing. Chinamana's head jerked up, thinking he misheard her. Nothing? Your people are innocent, and we do not hold the actions of others against the innocent. She answered. She directed her last remark to the rest of the Grand Council. But keep in mind, while we might forgive, we do not forget. <laughs>